Hi Chem 151 students, uh, welcome to week two where we start to talk about some real Chem 151 material, uh, nuclear chemistry. Uh, so this could also be called nuclear physics a bit. We don't get into as much details of this class, but uh, yeah. Uh, so this is the first topic for Chem 151. We'll also be doing experiment A, uh, which is a further Chem 150 review. I'd, I'd say it's pretty difficult, so I'll probably be giving you guys some help with that along the way. Maybe a few extra uh, bonus videos of of our office hours or uh, something like that. We you'll have the next couple weeks to work on that, but I'll give you a few tips and pointers here and there. But for now, let's focus on our Chem 151 material, nuclear chemistry. So uh, my little motto for Chem 151 is that Chem 151 is where chemistry gets real, right? Uh, and so we see real life applications of a lot of the things we're learning. I think one of the most um, kind of spectacular and fascinating applications of what we're going to learn in this chapter is the uh, the ITER project. Uh, and so here's a, a diagram of the ITER tokamak. If you search Google search on ITER, you'll find lots of interesting things. This is uh, they just they they've been doing a lot of pre-production. Uh, this has been in the works for decades. I remember reading about their hopes to do this back when I was in high school, and that's ooh, that, that's like 22 years ago now. Um, so uh, I was excited about it then. It took another decade before it started, and then finally, we're now seeing the. I just got goosebumps, goosebumps saying it. We're seeing the initial production and assembly of what will be the first commercial te uh, test nuclear reactor, uh, basically a proof of concept for a com commercial nuclear fusion reactor. So we've had nuclear fission reactors, but those tend to have problems where they have a lot of radioactive waste that comes out that's uh, hard to contain and you have to deal with. Also, uh, they can kind of run out of control. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how nuclear fusion reactors are different. Uh, they, they make lots of energy and they have no risk of running out of control. In fact, the hard part on a nuclear fusion reactor is to maintain very, very high temperatures like the core of the sun. So you can see here that the, uh, the tokamak, re uh, ITER tokamak reactor, tokamak talking about the shape of this, like a donut basically, um, is going to reach 150 million degrees Celsius, 10 times the temperature of the core of the sun, and it must be maintained at that temperature. That's the hard part of doing nuclear fusion and why we have not been able to do it yet. But uh, if we can accomplish this, uh, this will mean basically you know, energy and independence for mankind. We can finally stop worrying about energy uh, because the only fuel that we need for uh, one of these nuclear fusion reactors is hydrogen, which is what the sun is mostly made out of. So uh, let's talk about this and more as we start uh, nuclear chemistries first. We should talk about the differences between basically nuclear physics and chemistry. Uh, so nuclear reactions are really not much like a chemical reaction. So we can we kind of comparing and contrasting these two types of reactions. You can see on the first line here, in a chemical reaction, one substance is changed to another, but the the atoms all stay the same. They're just rearranging what other atom they're they're stuck to. However, in nuclear reactions, atoms are being converted into other types of atoms because parts of the nucleus are changing. There's going to be a different number of protons, uh, perhaps, after the end of a nuclear reaction. So you have a different atom. Uh, in chemical reactions, uh, el electrons are involved in you know, making bonds and, and forming bonds between atoms. In chemical reactions, these electrons are move, move around from one atom to another but no, no protons or neutrons are involved. But in a nuclear reaction, the protons and the neutrons are involved and the numbers of them will change and that's why you get different elements. The electrons are not really very important. Uh, they are important in some sense, we'll talk about what that is. Uh, their ejection and, and capture into the nucleus uh, does change the kinds of particles you have in the nucleus. However, the electrons that are around an atom don't really have much to do with the nuclear reaction. Uh, in a chemical reaction, there are relatively small energy changes that might be associated with the reaction. Uh, 
that might be surprising to you because if you think of like a bomb, like a you know dynamite or something uh, exploding, that's a chemical reaction, but that seems like a lot of energy. But that's nothing compared compared to a nuclear reaction. Nuclear reactions can can have much more energy. That's why the advent of the nuclear bomb was such a big thing because now the bomb is not made from a nuclear or chemical reaction. The energy coming out of a an atom bomb comes from nuclear reactions and, and the, the energy is much greater. Uh, there are also changes in mass. So one of the kind of ideas we hold dear in chemistry is the law of conservation of mass, but it turns out that's only approximately true. And when nuclear reactions happen, you can really see uh, the changes in mass and that's associated with a change in, in energy. Um, <clears throat> Finally, uh, in chemical reactions, the speed of the reaction, as we'll talk about in, in the chapter 16, the next chapter we study, it depends on various factors like the temperature of the reaction. Uh, you guys can see that if, if the reaction is like your milk spoiling, if you leave it on the counter, that reaction happens a lot faster, uh, those biochemical reactions. However, if you leave it in the fridge where it's cold, those reactions happen a lot faster or slower. Uh, so cold, you know, cold reactions go slow, hot reactions go fast, and other factors uh, can influence chemical reactions. But really, nuclear reactions are not affected by any of these same factors, such as temperature or uh, the, the amount of nuclei or, or the presence of a catalyst. All of these don't affect the rate of nuclear reactions. These happen uh, on their own time, uh, independent of how, mu how much is there and, and the temperature and all of that. So we'll talk about how fast nuclear reactions go as well. So um, how, how are we going to express these nuclear reactions? So we're going to express them with nuclear equations. They're going to look similar to chemical equations, but uh, they're going, we're going to talk about them in a little different way. First, I'm going to uh, kind of introduce some uh, new terminology here. Uh, one, of, one of these terms is nuclide. A nuclide is the name we're going to call a nucleus with a particular composition, such as a particular number of protons and neutrons. Uh, it will sometimes decay, meaning it will fall apart in various ways or eject certain pieces of itself. Uh, and when it does, we say it forms a daughter nuclide, and generally that will go in a direction of lower energy. So this is kind of similar to a chemical reaction. Chemical reaction will go from reactants to products and will produce products with lower energy, lower potential energy than the reactants. We'll talk more about that near the end of this class. But you can think about it kind of like how a ball rolls down a hill. The ball will roll down the hill on its own. It never rolls up the hill on its own. Uh, same way, nuclear and chemical reactions go in a direction where the products have less potential energy than the reactants. Just like the ball at the top of the at the bottom of the hill has less potential energy than the ball at the top of the hill. The ball at the top of the hill has potential energy due to its position because the ball can fall and then have connect and have turn its potential energy into movement or kinetic energy. Uh, when this energy is released, it's released as uh, you know radiation of various kinds, and we can capture that energy and use it to make electricity, or that energy could be you know the the product of a bomb, nuclear bomb or weapon. Uh, so the decay process will be represented by a balanced nuclear equation, kind of like how we have balanced chemical equations. Uh, but when we balance a nuclear equation, we'll be concerned with the total charge of everything and the total mass in terms of the mass number, the number of protons and neutrons. Uh, and so we'll be balancing that. So here, uh, the A here represents the mass number, which is the number of protons and neutrons. Z is the, the atomic number, the number of protons. Uh, and the, the, number, uh, the, the mass numbers all added together for all the reactants must be equal to the, the mass numbers of all the products added together. And the uh, atomic numbers for all the reactants uh, added together must be equal to the atomic numbers for all the products. And so remember from way back when in Chem 151, we, we do write the, uh, the mass numbers, the number of protons and neutrons up at the top left of a chemical symbol. 
when we write them and we write the atomic numbers when we write them at the bottom left and the, but the atomic number is generally the number of protons it will also represent other things when we do nuclear reactions okay so let's take a look at this kind of notation we're going to use for nuclides uh, so we're going to describe you know the, the mass and the charge of these particles by the notation and as i said Generally, the mass number, the number of protons and neutrons added together is written here, where we have a big A. And the charge of the particle will be represented by Z. So that's what's kind of new. Usually, we'll, re we'll, we'll write the number of protons here. And you know, in a, in a normal atom, the charge of the nucleus is the number of protons, because every proton counts for one positive charge. So your charge on the nucleus, just the nucleus, is equal to the number of protons. We're going to use this area to represent the charge of other particles, too. So some examples of particles that we have here is electrons, protons, and neutrons. So we're going to use this notation not only to talk about the nuclei of various atoms, but also electrons, protons, and neutrons. And we'll use this area on the bottom left to represent the charge. So for an electron, the bottom left here will be negative 1. For a proton, it will be positive 1. For a neutron, it will be zero, zero charge. And then the top left will be the mass. So we're going to give the electrons mass of zero. Protons have a mass of one, and neutrons have a mass of one. Uh, of course, protons and neutrons have slightly different masses. And electrons do have some small amount of mass. So this is going to actually factor into some, uh, especially the mass of the proton, the neutron. This is going to factor into some of our calculations, because we'll be looking at the masses very closely. But when we write these balanced nuclear equations, we just use the, the, you know, the uh, mass number here for these. So when nuclear processes happen, uh, there's going to be often an emission of a variety of different types of particles. And this slide is a list of those different types of particles. So um, one of these processes, nuclear processes that may occur, is called alpha emission. And these are called decay processes because they're, they're fission processes, meaning they're the nucleus breaking apart into smaller pieces. So sometimes when that happens, uh, there will be alpha emission in which an alpha particle is released. And that alpha particle can be represented in two ways, either with the Greek symbol alpha here, which looks like this, or as a helium nucleus. Uh, so that an alpha particle is a helium nucleus that's moving very quickly. Uh, so the helium nucleus will have uh, two protons and two neutrons. So its atomic number here is two for the two protons. And the mass number is four for two protons plus two neutrons. Uh, and so when this happens, the nucleus that loses the al uh, alpha particle and undergoes alpha emission, will its charge will go down by one. It will lose two protons. And it will lose four in mass due to the four protons and the four neutrons. So alpha emission involves a loss of two protons, two neutrons, and a total of four in mass. Another common type of nuclear decay process is beta emission. And this involves the emission of what's known as a beta particle. A beta particle is a high-energy electron, a fast-moving electron. Uh, it's often represented as beta or beta with a minus, either one, or often as an E, an electron, uh, with, with the indication here that it has zero mass and a negative one charge. So either of these are a fine way of uh, showing a beta emission, and you'll see both. The result of a, a loss of a beta particle is an increase in the atomic number by one because it's lost a negative charge. So essentially the result is the charge goes up by one. What we're going to see is the result is that a neutron is going to turn into a proton. Uh, and I'll show how that happens. So essentially we lose one uh, neutron, we gain one proton. The mass does not change because we lost something with no mass. We just lost something with a negative charge. So that causes that the charge go up by one. Essentially, a neutron turns into a proton in this process. Uh, another type of emission that often accompanies these other types, so often when you have alpha and beta emission happening, the nucleus will, will be picking up energy, and it will be excited, as they say. 
and will emit a high energy photon, which is called a gamma emission. Uh, and so, it, and it will be uh, gamma waves, uh, very high energy electromagnetic radiation. This has no mass and no charge. It's just, uh, just light, basically, high energy light. And so there'll be no change in the atomic number, the mass number, or the neutron. Uh, to another type of uh, nuclear decay process is positron emission. So this is probably the first time you've heard of a positron, but a positron is a particle that's like an electron in that it has no mass, but it has a charge of positive one instead of negative one. It is a type of antimatter. Uh, it's often indicated as a beta with a plus sign or more commonly an E with the positive one down here. So what happens in positron emission is the opposite of what happens in beta emission. So we essentially lose one positive charge as the positron, so the atomic number goes down by one. Uh, and, and since basically what's happened is we've lost a charge on a proton, it went from being positive one to having no charge, we, that proton basically turns into a neutron. But overall, no mass is lost because the positron does not have any mass. The last uh, type of process is called electron capture. And this is going to be basically uh, having a, a beta particle or an electron as a reactant, and it will be absorbed by the nucleus. Uh, so in this case, since it will be absorbing a negative electron, the charge will go down by one. Uh, and uh, basically a, a proton will be turned into a neutron, its charge will go from positive to nothing. Uh, and so the result of an electron capture is actually exactly the same as a positron emission. And so uh, these, these both result in the same change in atomic number, mass number, and, and neutron number. So uh, now let's talk about why. Why do these processes happen, okay? Uh, well, <clears throat> these processes happen because uh, some nuclei just happen to have a, no a, a number of neutrons or protons, a relative number of neutrons and protons that makes them unstable uh, so that their nuclei cannot stick together very well. Uh, the way, just to kind of in a very simple way describe the way the nucleus is held together is that the protons, they're positive, so they're not very, you know, they obviously repel each other in terms of electrostatics. Positives do not attract to positives, they attack to negatives. They repel to other positives. However, however, there's another type of force that occurs in the nucleus called the nuclear strong force. And it acts in very, very small locations, very small distances. And the, the result is that the neutrons, having more neutrons increases this, uh, this uh, strong force up to a point. Uh, so there needs to be a correct number, uh, a correct ratio of neutrons to protons because the neutrons kind of act like the glue that holds the protons together due to this nuclear strong force. And the result is that by observation, we, uh, we have observed that nuclei with certain ratios of neutrons to protons are stable. And, uh, and, and with other ratios of neutrons to protons, they are not. Uh, this proper ratio of, uh, for a stable nucleus is referred to here as the band of stability. This is the band of stability right here. Uh, and there, there's actually a really funny um, Big Bang Theory where uh, Sheldon thinks he's found some super stable nuclei way up here. Uh, outside of the known band of stability and uh, but it turns out he got his math he messed his math up and Stephen Hawking corrected him or something like that anyway uh, these black dots represent stable nuclei and so you can see so for a particular nucleus like let's say we're looking at um, neon here neon is right here uh, it has 10 protons and this one that's being pointed to here has 10 neutrons, so, so its mass number is 20. Uh, and so that is a stable neon nucleus. Another stable neon nucleus is one with one more neutron, 11 neutrons instead of 10. Uh, and so that, that has a mass number of 21, and that one's also stable. Also stable is neon with a mass number of 22. It has 12 neutrons and 10 and protons. Uh, 
And so, and then after, after with more neutrons, the, the neon nucleus is not stable. If it has less than 10 neutrons, it's also not stable. Uh, and so you can see here a couple of kind of overall observations about this, uh, about this uh, band of stability. At the lighter end, so when you're, when you're you know, under around 20 protons, the uh, the most stable nuclei usually have about the same number of neutrons and protons, like neon here, ten protons, ten neutrons. So for the lighter nuclei, like less than twenty protons, uh, you can see that the number of protons basically is is quite close to the number of neutrons, about equal. However, and that's what's represented by this purple line, by the way, neutrons and protons are equal. N over Z, N is neutrons, Z is protons, N over Z equals 1. So the neutrons and the protons are the same number. However, as the nuclei get bigger and bigger and there are more and more protons, they need more neutrons to help glue them together. So as Z increases the number of protons, N over Z must also increase for stable nuclei. There must be more neutrons. So once we get to iron with 26 protons, it's N over Z for its most stable nucleus is 1.15. Uh, this, this iron has 30 neutrons and 26 protons. So it has more neutrons than it has protons. As we get higher and higher up to silver, for example, here, which has 47 protons, uh, it needs to have, in order to be stable, 60 neutrons for its 47 protons. So its ratio, uh, 60 neutrons over 47 protons, is 1.28. Um, and then as we move up, the N over Z increases and increases until we get to the, the largest stable nucleus. So the largest known stable nucleus is bismuth-209 that has 83 protons. For all nuclei that have more than 83 protons, they are unstable and they're radioactive. They will undergo radioactive decay, uh, a nuclear decay. Um, and then looking a little bit closer here, if we look into this little box here, uh, this actually shows us what kind of decay each of these nuclei is most likely to undergo. And we can see here the black ones are the stable nuclei. Above the black ones are these blue. It says they undergo beta decay. Okay. And I'll explain to you why this is. Uh, you shouldn't straight up memorize this. You can memorize, okay, if N over Z is greater than, is, is too high, it will undergo beta decay. But I'll explain to you why that happens too, so you don't have to straight up memorize it. Uh, if N over Z is lower than the stable nuclei, these nuclei will undergo, generally undergo uh, positron emission or electron capture. Positron emission or electron capture here. Uh, whoops, and uh, and so um, and I'll also explain why this is. And a lot of different elements can undergo alpha decay. If if the uh, but if the element is bigger than bismuth, more protons, it's definitely going to go undergo alpha decay because alpha decay will make the the nucleus smaller. Basically, if if the if there's too many neutrons, the nucleus is under going to go under going to going to undergo beta decay because that essentially turns a neutron into a proton and causes the ratio to get closer to stability. If there's not enough neutrons, N over Z is too low, then the nucleus will tend to undergo positron emission or electron capture because that will turn a proton into a neutron and thus raise the number of neutrons and bring it closer to uh, stability. So let's talk a little bit more about this nuclear stability. So, oops, I got my, uh, my animation wrong here. But anyway, uh, so every element in the periodic table is going to have a common radioactive isotope. So this, we're surrounded by uh, radioactive elements undergoing nuclear decay. We're being bombarded by these particles all the time, by radioactive particles. Fortunately, there's really if they're low enough, uh, our body can repair any damage that may occur fast enough, so it's not a big deal. Uh, it's only when the radiation exposure gets higher uh, that it's a big, it's a problem, and we'll talk more about that. Um, hydrogen is the only element 
that uh, its most stable isotope has no neutrons, that's because it only has one proton, so it doesn't need any neutrons to help stick protons together. Uh, as you saw from the band of stability diagram, the ratio of neutrons to protons gradually increases uh, as we have more and more protons. And all isotopes that are heavier than bismuth-209 are radioactive. Some of them may be somewhat stable, uh, like uranium. You'll find some uranium around, but it, it is radioactive. Uh, it's uh, stable enough to, to find some, though, that's around. So I, I mentioned that uh, beta decay will decrease the neutron to proton ratio, beta emission or beta decay. Why is this? This is what I want you to do is think about it this way. We want to decrease the, the proton to neutron ratio. So what it is that we want to do is we want to turn, in this case, a neutron which has a mass of one and a charge of zero we want to turn this into a proton, which has a mass of one and a charge of one, okay? In order for that to happen, well, we need to have a balanced nuclear reaction. And what this means is that all of our atomic numbers must add up on the same side, uh, to the same thing on each side, and all of our uh, mass numbers must add up to this to the same thing on each side. So for example, on the right side, I have a proton. If I want to have something else in which I add to its mass number and it equals what's on the left, which is one for, for a neutron, I will need something with a mass of zero. And again, if I want the atomic numbers on the right to add up to what I have on the left here, I'm going to need something with a atomic number charge of negative one. Well, what kind of particle is that? That is a beta particle, an electron. So beta emission results in a neutron turning to a proton and a beta particle. And uh, this is just this and this are just two ways of showing a beta particle. So you don't have to memorize that it's beta emission that happens when a neutron, neutron uh, there's too many neutrons and the neutron to proton ratio is too high. Just think, okay, neutron to proton ratio is too high. I need a neutron to turn into a proton. How might that happen? Well, for the nuclear equation to be balanced, it must be that an electron or a beta particle is emitted. And you can see here, this does add up, right? Zero plus one on this side equals one on the left side. And negative one plus one on the right side, that adds up to zero, which is the same as what we have on the left side. So you'll notice I don't really have this memorized. I just reason it out in my head when I need to. Uh, you'll find that I teach you a lot of that. I don't memorize hardly anything. Uh, and I don't suggest you do either if you want to know it forever. Instead, you should always know how to reason back to where you were, and I'll teach you that all the time, because I think that's the path to real, lasting knowledge, uh, not just memorizing a bunch of stuff. That's pretty worthless. It won't help you later on. Okay. Now, positron emission supposedly will help us to increase our neutron to proton ratio. So what we want in, in, in this case is we want our we want more protons or sorry more neutrons and less protons so we would want to maybe turn a proton into a neutron that will increase our number of neutrons and decrease our number of protons okay well a proton has mass of one and charge of one a neutron has a mass of one a charge of zero so what would have to be emitted in order for this to occur well we have to make sure that the uh, the um, the nuclear equation would be balanced that means in order for our mass numbers to be balanced we need them on the right side to add up to one so zero plus zero plus one adds up to one so 
that zero plus one here adds up to what we would have on the left side, one. Now we need something that we could add to zero to make one, that would be one. So what kind of particle has a charge of one and a mass of zero? That is a positron. That's a positron. It's like an electron, it has zero mass, but it has a charge of positive one instead of ne negative one. So positron emission means a proton turns into a neutron and a positron. And so this process will increase our neutron to proton ratio because it will turn a proton into a neutron. So we'll have more neutrons, less protons. Now equivalently, electron capture will do this as well. Let's see why. What is electron capture? Electron capture means we've got some uh, proton, let's say. Again, we want to turn a proton into a neutron, but this time we're going to, instead of doing it by losing something, we're going to do it by capturing something, capturing an electron. So our proton is one and one, one mass, one charge. Our neutron is one mass, zero charge. What would have to go here, whoops, uh, what would have to go here in order to make this balance? Well, we would need a zero up here because one plus zero is one, and we would need a negative one down here uh, because negative one, one plus negative one is zero. So this arrangement represents an electron or a beta particle. So this is electron capture. A proton and an electron make a neutron. So notice, I didn't have that memorized. I just knew based on the, the simple math here, okay? And I can get back to it any time I want. So this is why beta emission uh, will, will decrease the neutron to proton ratio because it will turn a neutron into a proton. Uh, positron emission electron capture will increase the neutron to proton ratio because they will turn a proton into a neutron. So you'll have less protons, more neutrons, thus increasing the neutron to proton ratio. Now, as we said, for very large elements, uh, alpha emission will happen. It will make the nucleus smaller. So for alpha emission, this means an alpha particle is going to be emitted. So we'll have some element here. It will lose an alpha particle, and the resulting nucleus will have four less mass and two less charge. I'll show you an example of alpha emission right after this. So alpha emission is what will make the whole nucleus smaller. It doesn't change, uh, you know, the number. Well, you're going to lose two protons and two neutrons both. You you just lose a bunch of mass there. So uh, this is the the summary of what we just uh, we just talked about. If your nucleus is neutron rich, meaning it has a high neutron to proton ratio. It will undergo beta, de beta decay. If it is proton rich, meaning it has a low neutron to proton ratio, it will undergo beta decay. And if it's heavy with a with a uh, um, atomic number greater than 83, it will undergo alpha decay. Now, I'll show you a little trick too. So, you know this this uh, diagram we had back here. You're, you might be thinking, oh, do I have to memorize where exactly what the neutron to proton ratio should be? Like, do I have to memorize that around here it's 1.28, around here it's 1.49? I'll tell you no, because you've got, <coughs> you've got a secret weapon, and that's a periodic table. That uh, gives you the average atomic mass in, in AMUs of the most stable nuclei. So you can usually guess based on the mass, the mass number relative to the average atomic mass, whether it's neutron rich, proton rich, or, or obviously if it's heavy. So let's look at some examples. So a very common question that I'll ask you and definitely will appear on the uh, quiz is write the equation or what is the product of the alpha emission of something? One example here is radon-222. So radon-222 is, is uh, concerning to people because Radon is a gas, uh, and it undergoes alpha decay, so it can seep into homes. Uh, so this is a radon detector here, uh, and then it can be breathed, and then once you breathe it, you might have some radioactivity going on inside your body, which can be scary. 
uh, and we'll talk more about the health effects later. So I could ask you, what's the product of the alpha emission of radon 222? Uh, first of all, you might want to know, well, uh, what is the, the, the atomic number? Uh, often that isn't written. So we can... Uh, So we can uh, look here for radon. Okay, radon's right here. Its atomic number is 86. So we're going to want to uh, we're going to want to write that here. Okay, so we're going to want to write that in 86. And I'm going to write it in red because you really don't need to write this as long as you have a periodic table. You can always get it. That's why it's often not written. Okay. And we know that it's going to go alpha decay, which means it's going to release an alpha particle, which you can write like this. Or you can write like this, alpha, 4, 2, whatever. Uh, either one of those is fine. Okay. And this is going to make something. And we have to figure out what the something is. The way we figure that out is we want to know what uh, down here, what's going to add with 2 to make 86. Now you can do some you know fancy math. 86 minus 2 will give you what x is here. So basically 2 plus x is 86. So if we if we take 86 and we remove 2 we get 84. Okay so 84 plus 2 is 86. Remember whatever's on the right side of the equation must add up to everything on the left side. We only have one thing on the left side. It's right on. Okay and uh, now the same thing happens here. We need a number that adds with four to make 222. That would be 218, 218. Okay, so now we have the mass number. We also have the atomic numbers. We can go look at the periodic table and we can figure out which element that will be. So why don't you look at your periodic table? I'm gonna, uh, if you do, you'll find that this element is polonium. And I kind of overwrote this, so I'm going to erase a little bit here. Okay. And let's erase a little bit. You know, let me erase. Okay. Well, I accidentally covered up my result here, but... Um, <clears throat> yeah, we get polonium, which is element number 84. So we could write that in there if we wanted to. Polonium. You'd use your periodic table to do that. Uh, so that's an example of writing the nuclear equation for alpha emission. What about beta emission or beta decay? Well, uh, one example of beta emission that we use is for carbon-14. So carbon-14 is a radioactive carbon nucleus. And... Uh, it exists in all living things, and when they die, uh, they stop breathe, breathing, so they, they don't get any more car or they stop eating rather, so they don't get any more carbon 14, and the amount of carbon 14 decays over time. So you can use that to determine when an organism died. Uh, so this is going to undergo beta decay, which means that, and, and a carbon is element number six. You can look that up on the periodic table. So that means it's going to release a beta particle, which you can write like this, zero, negative one as an electron, or you could write it as a beta. You could also write it beta minus like that. Either one is fine. Um, I like this way because I like to write the values there. Uh, okay, and now we need some number here that's going to add to negative one to make six. So that number would be seven, because seven, plus negative one is six. So the, the atomic numbers on this side add up to the atomic numbers on the other side. And then we need something that adds to zero to make 14, that would be 14. And so if we look on the periodic table for what is element seven, that would be nitrogen. Uh, so we can write an N here. And so when carbon 14 undergoes beta decay, it makes a nitrogen 14. And so that's how you do that, that one. And next, positron emission. Okay, positron emission uh, of 
An example of positron emission is fluorine 18. So you may have heard of positron emission in the context of PET scans. Oops, I showed the answer here, but PET scans, uh, positron emission tomography. Uh, so this uses fluor fluorine 18. And uh, when it undergoes positron emission, uh, the positron will hit an electron that's nearby and that will release gamma radiation, which can then go to a detector. So you do get exposed to radiation in a PET scan. I'm just going to work this out, even though you see the answer here. Uh, fluorine is element 9, if you look on the periodic table, element 9. Uh, and so it will, un if it's undergoing positron emission, I'll write the positron here. So this is going to be E. E with a um, negative one, uh, sorry, positron, positive one, right? Positive one for the charge and zero for the mass. So this is a positron. You could also write it like this as a beta plus. Um, <clears throat> or this, your book sometimes write it, writes it like this. And we want to figure out what will be produced. Well, we need a number that adds with one to make nine for the atomic number. That would be eight. Eight. And then we need a for the mass number, we need a number that adds with zero to make 18. That would be 18. And element eight, if you look on the periodic table, is oxygen. And so the product of the positron emission of fluorine 18 is oxygen 18. And so that's how you write the equations for nuclear decay. In terms of electron capture, uh, electron capture means a, an electron will be the reactant. Uh, and so I showed this to you earlier. And you could have any other reactant here. Uh, but remember that the negative one plus whatever's here has to add up to what's on the other side. And, uh, and, and uh, the mass number is here, zero plus positive one ends up one. It, remember, overall, an electron capture, just like positron emission, uh, it, the overall process is a proton that's turning into a neutron. Uh, finally, gamma emission. Uh, this is just when, when, a, when a nucleus is undergoing lots of other types of emission, it will pick up energy along the way. And finally, uh, it, you'll get an excited nucleus, and it will release a uh, high-energy photon, electromagnetic radiation, and, uh, and that has zero mass, zero charge, it's just energy. And that's where the nuclear energy, for the most part, comes from, is these gamma rays. So uh, let's do a little bit of practice before we finish up this part of the lesson. So what kind of radioactive decay would tungsten 160 undergo? And then write the reaction for that. Well, as I said, there is a little trick that you can use for this. You don't have to memorize that table. What we can do is we know that this tungsten weighs 160. Okay, let's compare that to the average mass of a tungsten, uh, tungsten element here, tungsten atom. So let's find tungsten. It's uh, right here. So the average tungsten uh, nucleus weighs 183 about 184 um, in terms of its mass number. So this is the average atomic mass, right? Not all of them, you know, obviously none of them weigh 183.84. This is an average of all of them that are out there and stable. But the stable ones seem to weigh a lot more here. So our neutrons are not enough. We don't have enough neutrons. Uh, if we had enough neutrons, our mass would be a lot higher. Uh, so we have a low n over z ratio here. A low n over z ratio here. So that's what we figured out. And so what we want to do is we want to, uh, we, want, we have a low n over z. So we want a process that's going to turn a neutron into a proton. Uh, or sorry, a proton into a neutron. We want more neutrons because we don't have enough neutrons. So if you can't remember, that's okay. Do what I do. I don't always remember either. I only teach this every once in a while. Maybe, you know, 
uh, I don't use it except when I'm teaching it, but I know that I need more neutrons, so a proton is going to become a neutron. Okay, uh, and so proton is one mass, one charge. Neutron is one mass, zero charge. So how is, is this going to happen? How are we going to uh, turn a proton into a neutron? What kind of decay would have to happen here? Well, it would have to be a positron emission. Because one plus zero is one. Right? And, uh, and one plus zero over here is one. So uh, a, pos a positron emission is possible, also electron capture. But let's write the positron emission then. Okay. So let's say positron emission. 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 Or electron capture. Okay. So we're going to write tungsten 160. And uh, let's go find out again what element is tungsten. I wish it wouldn't do that loud noise when I do this. But we can see that tungsten is element 74. So uh, we can write that right down here, 74. All right. And it's going to undergo positron emission. So one product is going to be 0 and positive 1 there. We can put the plus or not. Uh, but the result is that we're going to get an element that is, it adds with 1 to make 74. So the mass number, or the atomic number must be 73. The mass number but one must be 160 because 160 plus 0 is 160. So we have to go and see, OK, which element is that? Oh, hmm, 73. It's tantalum. Tantalum that it made. Okay. So, it's going to be tantalum. And uh, so, yeah, we've written the reaction here for the positron emission. Okay. Uh, so next, uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to start to talk about nuclear fission. Uh, and so we'll go through all, all of the uh, energy that's involved in, in nuclear fission and nuclear reactions. Uh, so you might, this equation might be familiar, E equals mc squared. Hmm, where'd you hear that from? You can think about that. And next time we'll talk a little bit more about it. See you next time.